Hello, and welcome to our third lecture in Module 7. Uh, today we're going to be talking about language. We'll start off with a brief introduction to language and some of the universals of language, talk about analyzing language, then we'll get into the phonology or sounds of language, talk about um, lexical syntax and Chomsky's transformational grammar, lexical and semantic factors, and then we'll finish up with a brief discussion of discourse as an important part of understanding language. Uh, now, there's a great deal more to learn about language. Certainly, if you took a linguistics course, they could tell you a great deal more. Uh, we'll do a basic introduction to some of the cognitive aspects of language. So linguistics is the academic, formal academic study of language. Psycholinguistics is the study of how people learn and use language. So there are a variety of different fields that you might uh, get involved with, and these intersect with cognition in a variety of ways. Obviously, this is a skill, requires memory, knowledge, all of the things we've talked about. So language is, in itself, simply a shared symbolic system of communication. Languages can be spoken, written, gestural, um, can be all of those or only one of those. Uh, all of these are examples of different types of uh, symbolic systems of communication. One could even argue that emojis are potentially a part of language because they are a shared symbolic system of communication, assuming you know what they're trying to communicate. So each uh, language has some universality to it. Um, so for example, uh, all language has what we call semanticity. That is, it conveys some sort of meaning. So language is des designed and intentionally conveying meaning from one person to another. Language is also inherently arbitrary. There is no inherent connection between the symbols and their meaning, as, of course, Shakespeare famously supposedly once said, arose by, you know, in whatever Shakespearean play it was, arose by uh, any other name would smell as sweet. So rose is just simply arbitrary. And anyone who has studied multiple languages knows that there's really no rhyme or reason to uh, the way in which language is constructed. Flexibility of symbols. We can change connections and invent new connections. New things come up all the, all the time. Um, we combine words in what we call a portmanteau. We do things like combine, shorten words and combine them with other words and come up with things like email. Um, that sort of thing. Naming is another universal language. Of course, we assign names to everything. That's how language functions. Uh, displacement is another universal language, the ability to talk about other moments in time, both past and future. I was there yesterday. I'm going here tomorrow. And finally, productivity. Language is a creative process. We don't reproduce language. We create language, that is, we produce language. Um, so every time you go to speak a sentence, you have to create it. It is a creative process. Now, of course, we sometimes do reproduce language. So-and-so said this, or you're reading out a paragraph. But when that language itself, that text is created, it is a productive process. So there are a variety of ways that we can think about and analyze language. Um, First of all is the grammar or the rules of language. All languages have some sort of grammatical structure to them. Uh, we talk about the phonology or the sounds of language we'll talk about here in a moment. Syntax, which has to do with uh, word order and grammaticality. There's a specific way in which language, each language is structured in terms of what um, order of words we use and ways in which uh, language can or cannot be grammatically correct. Uh, lexical or semantic factors are word meaning and integration of word meaning. Um, so when we talk about lexicology, um, the lexicon, we're talking about words and their meanings. So those are the rules in which we use to create and produce language. Uh, there are conceptual analyses of language, that is analysis of language with reference to knowledge. And then finally, belief. And this is reference to one's own beliefs and beliefs about a speaker's intent. So when we process language, we're not just processing the words. We're processing what we believe they mean. And that's one of the important things about language communication, and we'll talk a bit about this when we get to discourse, is what you say is not necessarily what someone hears, or they certainly don't hear what you meant to say or the way in which you meant it. 
And so if they have a belief about what you're trying to say, that belief can override your intent and oftentimes even change what they hear. And you see this all the time in meetings. I see it in faculty meetings all the time. One person says something, the other person hears something entirely different. And you try to figure out how you've both been in the same, you've all been in the same room at the same time. And so that has to do with this belief about speaker's intent. So that gets us to phonology. Phonology is the analysis of the sounds of language. So phonemes are the basic sounds of language. Um, so each language has its own specific set of phonemes, and not every language has the same phonemes as another. So some languages don't have a W sound, for example, or an L sound, or um, a P sound. Um, so, and I mean, P, not, <laughs> anyway. Um, so uh, those kinds of sounds uh, aren't across all languages. So those consonant sounds uh, are the first things we'll talk about from an English perspective. Three variables contribute to making these sounds. Place of articulation, so where in the vocal tract uh, the flow of air is interrupted. So the back, the front, t, like t, or g, uh, i. Um, manner of articulation, how is the air flow disrupted? Is it sharp, as in t, or is it soft, as in g, or that sort of thing? Voicing, the timing of vocal cord vibrations, depends on if you get a t or a p sound. Vowel sounds uh, occur when there's no disruption of airflow, and it's the placement in the mouth, front, back, and center, and tongue position in the mouth, high, middle, and low. So, e, a, o, a, that sort of thing. You can play around with this yourself. Fortunately, you can't see me doing any of these things. Um, so. Uh, the way in which you place your tongue in the mouth and the placement in the mouth of the front, center, or back is where a vowel sound comes from, consonant sounds come from the disruption of airflow, and where that air is disrupted and how it's disrupted. Combining phonemes into words, uh, there are some specific rules for combining phonemes into words. Um, you won't see um, one phoneme following the other, uh, for example. Um, and our extensive knowledge of these rules is what we call our phonemic confidence. We know when a word sounds right and when it doesn't. Uh, and we have a remarkable ability to perceive language, uh, even though it's extraordinarily variable. And we call this the problem of invariance. We hear them generally the same. Even though somebody's accent may be different, in general we hear the same language. Um, provided the uh, pronunciation is close enough that we can understand it. Um, and so that phonemic confidence, that um, ability to perceive language is pretty extraordinarily variable um, at different speeds, different pitches, uh, different uh, inflections. All of those things uh, are different, but they sound and convey the same sort of meaning. Uh, one of the things we also do is overlap phonemes when we speak. This is called co-articulation. Um, this is how words are formed into single um, units by co-articulating the phonemes because if we eat, <laughs> didn't, <laughs> something like that, it would sound crazy. Uh, so we overlap phonemes, and again, that's called co-articulation. So that then gets us uh, to talking about uh, syntax. And syntax is how we develop words and word order into meaning. So sentences are more than just collections of words. Um, English really relies on word order to convey meaning, probably almost more than any other language, which is one of the reasons why it's devilishly difficult to learn. So for example, we can take the same three words and have three very different meanings. A red fire engine versus a fire engine red versus a red engine fire. So all three of these are completely different, uh, but yet use the same three words. Phrase order uh, is how we order larger word units and how they can influence meaning. So Bill told the men to deliver the piano on Monday is different from Bill told the men on Monday to deliver the piano. And so here we've reordered the phrase and completely altered uh, the meaning of our sentence. And so this word order and phrase order is really important. And it's one of the things you see as people are learning new languages, they often have difficulty with word order and phrase order. Um, so that gets us to uh, Noam Chomsky's transformational grammar. Uh, and I apologize with the deep structure here on the bottom. We'll pull that out here in a minute. Um, 
So the first part of Chomsky's transformational grammar is the surface structure. And this is just simply the structure of the sentence as it is spoken or written. So it's the letters, it's the sounds. The phrase structure is the underlying structure of a sentence based on meaningful phrases. So you can break it out into things like the dog chased the bicycle. And then the deep structure is an abstract representation of the meaning of the sentence. So what does it mean to say the dog chased the bicycle? Um, so we have surface structure, phrase structure, and deep structure. And deep structure is really the meaning of a sentence. The phrase structure is the structure of the phrases. And of course, the surface structure are the sounds or letters themselves. There are transformational rules that we use to convert deep structure into surface structure to produce language. So we know what we intend to convey, which is the deep structure. And then we create surface structure from those transformational rules to create our phrases and our surface structure. So that then gets us to talking about lexical and semantic factors before we move on to discourse. The mental lexicon is our mental dictionary of words and their meaning. Um, and so all of the words that we know and we gain, we keep getting more and more language. You're getting a bunch of them today. Uh, morphemes are the smallest units of language that have meaning. So unhappiness has three different morphemes. Un, happy, and ness. So happy is obviously an emotion. Un conveys a state of not, and ness conveys um, an overall state. Versus happy is an emotion, happiness is a state of being in that emotion. Now, it's unclear if we access the individual morphemes, morphemes, not morphemes, morphemes, um, and combine them to figure out the meaning, or do we process the entire word? And it probably really depends on our experience with the word itself. So uh, our semantic knowledge and syntax are, of course, tied with one another. No, another. Our knowledge can override syntax in how we perceive and remember. Uh, so how we perceive someone's language uh, and how we uh, process or remember someone's language will often depend on our knowledge. So how we perceive it and how we remember something, of course, will alter the syntax. Remember uh, Bartlett's War of the Ghosts study, where his participants recalled um, the War of the Ghost study and altered both the content um, and uh, syntax of the, the passage. Finally, then, we get to discourse. And discourse is more about communication. And that is, how do we understand meaning and intent? So when we think of discourse, it's not just about the language itself, but trying to convey meaning and trying to understand how it influences people's beliefs. So um, written and spoken language convey discourse, and they do so differently. This is one of the reasons why email is so fraught with difficulty, because you oftentimes cannot convey your meaning in the same way you can in a spoken conversation. We've all had conversations go awry because they're conducted over text and email instead of in person. So I always encourage people, whenever possible, to communicate in person. So conversations between people proceed relatively smoothly due to some shared some assumptions, or what we call maxims. Uh, and not everyone follows these, but uh, this is the best way to have a good conversation or a good level of discourse. The first of these is the maxim of, qu of quantity. Say as much as needed to be informative, but no more than needed. We certainly know plenty of people who don't know when to stop with their information, and I'm one of those people. Um, quality, say only what you believe to be true. Relation, make your contribution relevant. And manner, make you clear, brief, and to the point. And these are very important to have a quality level of conversation, a quality level of dif discourse, particularly in things like a public forum. If you're trying to um, have a discussion with a politician, um, if you are a politician, um, quality, um, relation, and manner are really important to having a high level, high quality level of discourse. And that's one of the problems we see in um, the world today is our level of discourse has uh, declined. Probably a lot of it's because of quality. Uh, oftentimes it's not relevant and not often clear and brief and to the point. Uh, but when you're discussing with your friends and colleagues, try to stick to these manners for high quality discourse. Well, that gets us to the end of language. Uh, we'll talk next about brain and language, in particular about different types of aphasia and how they af affect different people.